do things a bit different this morning. It's good to just, uh, I think it's good to just kind of shake us up a little bit and change things around. Otherwise, just become like you're kind of in automatic mode. You know, you know exactly what's going to happen next, and then that's going to happen. And it, it, I think it causes a spiritual sleepiness. <laughs> so uh, just we just kind of swap things around sometimes, just to kind of get people concentrating a little bit more. So uh, this morning, we're going to look at um, the parables of Jesus. We're up to parable number 13. And I'm going to read uh, that to you. This is the parable of the net, or parable of the dragnet, you might know it as. Uh, so it's in Matthew chapter 13. It's only a very short parable. Matthew 13. And verse 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. Uh, it challenges us as much as it comforts us, Lord. But I thank you that there is always hope in Jesus Christ. And through his gospel. So Lord I pray that your spirit would move upon me this morning and help me to expound uh, these words in an accurate and uh, Christ honouring way. Lord I pray that you would uh, just enable me to, to draw out all the goodness and all uh, the truth <coughs> that is contained in this parable. Lord I uh, we sang that hymn, I need thee every hour, Lord, I need you now. Uh, I need this, Lord, to be right and in the right spirit. So I pray, Lord, that you would help me to be humble and help me, Lord, to listen to the, the guidance of your spirit this morning. Uh, that it might be spiritual food for those who have gathered to hear the word of God. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so... Um, you heard the parable. Before we go any further, I thought it'd be good just to have a little bit of a recap. Because I mean, we're up to what, uh, parable number 13, or sermon 13. Uh, it'd be good to just kind of think back and remind ourselves what we've looked at. So here's a brief list of uh, the, the 12 that we did. The Good Samaritan, Pearl of Great Price, a New Cloth on Old Garment, The Rich Fool, The Prodigal Son, The Parable of the Leaven, The Persistent Widow, The Parable of the Light, the, weed among the, the weeds among the wheat, uh, the grain of wheat, ten palms. Then last week we did the parable of the moat and the beam, or if you like, the speck and the log, I guess sometimes called some translations. And do you remember I said right at the beginning that scholars tend to categorize these into three different categories? Uh, they are evangelical, didactic, and prophetic. So evangelical meaning that to do with salvation or to do with the coming of the kingdom of God. Didactic just means it's, it's teaching something, whether it's a principle or a lesson, it might be a moral lesson. And prophetic in that it, it, it usually return, to do with the return of Jesus Christ and judgment in Christ. Yeah? And so I, I kind of try to categorize. It's difficult because sometimes they cross over, you know. So you might not agree with how I categorize that. But, but that, they do... You know, really sort of seem to fall in the, in the most simplest into those kind of categories. Uh, and, and I don't know if you notice, as you kind of look back over those titles, and you might call to mind really what um, what Jesus is saying and what, what Jesus is teaching, that you know most of them do seem to be dealing with salvation or separating yourself uh, from the, the world. Uh, and, and also, you know, there's, come, there's going to be a judgment coming. Christ is going to return, therefore get right with him. And I want you now to think about 
Think about all the preachers that you know, all the churches you've been to. And you know, what what did they teach? If, if they taught salvation, you must be saved, you know, the gospel, you've got to be born again. If they taught, you know, the, the same kind of things that Jesus taught, walking in holiness, you know, walking in obedience to Christ. If they were teaching, you know, Christ is going to return, there's going to be a time of judgment there, or make sure that you're right with him. If they're teaching that, then they're a good teacher. Right? Now, I'm not necessarily saying it's a good church, because you can teach that and not live it. But if they're teaching that and living it, giving an example, then that's, that's good teaching, that's good preaching. And that is a good church. If they're not teaching that, if they're not teaching what Christ, you know, some things are kind of noticeable to me by their absence. You know, in these parables, you know, is there any parable that's teaching all religions are the same? Just, just, is Jesus teaching that at any point? Is he saying, look, hey, don't worry, all religions are the same? Is Jesus at any point teaching, hey, God wants you to be rich? In any of these parables, it looks like parable 13. You know, has he ever taught? Yeah, look, God wants you to rich. He wants you to have lots of money and lots of possessions. Does Jesus at any point say that you must, quote, stand with Israel, end quote? Have you seen that in any of those 13 parables that we've looked at? Maybe, maybe I'm saving them all up at the end and I'm just being a little bit sly. Even, but you know these things that people focus on so much, Jesus is not focusing on them, is it? It's about walking in holiness, you know, living righteously. It's about look, the kingdom of God has come. Repent, believe on me. It's about you know, I, I'm going to to the cross, but I'll return. Be ready for that return. Be ready for that time of judgment. Get right with God now. It's, it's righteousness, it's sin, it's, it's repentance. Am I right? And that will maybe what he's teaching in his parables. Yeah, don't be hypocritical. You know, don't, don't, don't kind of get, you know, separate yourself from these people just because they don't believe the same truth. No, separate from the world. Separate from the world. So I think, I think you know, you have to take the parables of Jesus as being, look, this is Jesus' main kind of teaching. This is what he's on about. Uh, uh, Self-sacrifice, salvation, holiness, judgment. It's a hard fight. It's a hard, narrow pathway. As you sow, so shall you eat. This is the spirit of what is what is taught. I'm happy for someone to say, no, no, pastor, you're wrong. He, do, he doesn't teach that. You can, if you can refute that, I'd like to see it, because I think that's what Jesus is teaching all the way along. Obviously there are other things, the love of God, uh, you know, come, come, come to me and I'll take your burden. So, but I mean, even then, he, he says, come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. But then he says, take my burden, take my, my weight upon you, my yoke. It's still a yoke, even though it's easy. It's not like the yoke of sin, but it's still a yoke. There's still work to be done there. But if you're at church and that's what's being taught, the things that Christ teaches, then that's a good church. Especially if he's living it, that's a good church. But if you're going somewhere and it's not being taught, something else is being taught, something else is being emphasised, then that's not a good church. And that's not a good minister. In fact, I'm going to stick my neck out and say, he's not a minister of Christ. No minister be servant, because a servant of Christ teaches what Christ taught. Does that make sense? Is that a fair comment? I know it's a hard comment, but it's a fair comment. If you're not preaching what Christ preached, if you're not teaching what Christ taught, then you're not a minister of Christ. You're ministering something. You're a minister of something else. Ministers of Christ teach what Christ taught. And most of what he taught is in the parables. In fact, the scripture says, all these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them. So all this teaching is given, it's in parables, to the multitudes that are gathered, he's coming with his parables. 
explains the parables to the disciples, but he's teaching in parables. So let's have a look. What is Jesus <coughs> saying in the parable of the net? So this is a, I called it a drag net before. A drag net, I guess it's probably one of the simplest forms of fishing that you can do. So what they would do is they would lower a net down into the water, like in a river or whatever, and they would just drag that net right across the bottom of the river. And whatever was in the way, it just gets caught up in the net. Yeah? And so you haul it out at the end, at the other end. And you've got all sorts of things. You've got fish, good fish, that is fish you can eat. You've also got bad fish, poisonous, toxic fish, you can't eat those. You've also got other objects, haven't there? Like an old salmon or an old pot or something like that. Things you don't want. But you've just gathered, all you've done, you've just gathered them all together. And so the, the main risk of this, this parable is basically one, the spreading of a net. Two, the evaluation of the catch. Three, uh, the gathering of the good fish. And four, the casting away of the bad fish. It's quite a short parable, isn't it? But that's basically what's going down uh, in this parable. But what does it mean? Well, the net represents the gospel. Uh, and I, I quite like, Carol said something before. She said uh, about, uh, oh gosh, I can't remember it. It was... You said something about those whom God had gathered, gathered in the knowledge of the truth of, of escaping, something like that. That God had gathered people together with this knowledge of how to escape. And I really like that. So I thought, yeah, that, that's how I'm thinking about this. Is that the gospel does that. It gathers people together. It, it provides a knowledge of how to escape your sin and how to escape the judgment of this world. And it draws people in. As you share that gospel message, as you preach it, people come in and they tend to gather in what we call the visible church. You know, I've heard that phrase, the visible church. That is, God gathers them together and they come into congregations like this. They just come together into these bodies, these churches, the visible church. But that's not the end of the story. The net represents the gospel. Those fish who've allowed themselves to be drawn in by this gospel. But here's a question. Who are the fishermen? Now some will say, well, it's the angels, because it says the angels are kind of sorting them out, you know, uh, and that's how it will be at the end of the world. Well, that's only part of it. Because think about it. Who are the fishermen? Who are the ones who are casting that gospel net out? Angels don't tend to, to preach the gospel or the revelation. It talks about an angel uh, speaking the everlasting gospel. But it tends to be, doesn't it? It's men and women who are going out and sharing this gospel, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> what did Jesus say to Peter and Andrew? Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Yeah, Matthew 4.19. So it, it seems to be reasonable to assume that, that the one casting the net, the fishermen, are actually the preachers of the gospel. They're casting that net, as it were. But then there is also, I think, a, a, a purging process. The fishermen begin that process themselves, but the angels will finish it at the end of the world. You get that? The fishermen, the preachers, will start that process. It's always the same. If you preach the gospel and someone comes up and they're interested and they say, oh yeah, okay, I'm interested, tell me a bit more about this gospel. And they've been drawn in by it. But then when you start to talk about, well, it's about sin, it's about repentance, it's about getting right. Some will want to hear more. Some will say, oh no, I'm interested in that. You're starting it. You're starting that purging process right there. Because you're laying down the criteria for following Christ, which is what Christ himself always did, isn't it? Yeah, when the people came, he started to say, right, it's like this. You want to be my disciple? It's got to be like this. And so, and so those who are sharing the gospel, we have that responsibility. We have that responsibility of integrity. 
It's very important, I think, to understand me. This parable. We have a responsibility. We're not just we're not just saying what we think, are we? We are ambassadors for the kingdom of God. We have a, we're heralds. You know, that's what the to preach is to herald. You know, like in the old days when they would send the herald to the opposing army and they say, okay, these are the king's conditions for your surrender. Okay, this is, I'm just a messenger. These are, the, these are the conditions for you to surrender. And that's what we're doing when we bring the gospel to the unsaved. We're saying, look, God wants you to surrender to him. He wants you to yield to his spirit. And these are the terms and conditions of the surrender. It's nothing to do with me. This is what my king has told me to share with you. And that takes a boldness to do that. Because you know, some things you say, they're going to like. Some things you say, they're probably not going to like. And in fact, when you say them, you might lose them. Are you prepared for that? Are you ready for that? Because there's a big temptation there, isn't there? If I fudge what I'm going to say, if I kind of compromise it a bit, if I soften it a bit, it might not go away. Ah, uh, yeah, but you've changed the message. That's not what your king told you to say. So this is a parable about integrity, about a preachers or, or even just some witnessing about the gospel about Christian integrity. There's a purging process that starts and it finishes uh, with the angels. Now this is all over the scriptures, you know. What does Peter say? Judgment begins with the house of God. Judgment begins with the house of God. You know, there's... there's it's not just come as you are, do what you want. It's like, look, we have to start analysing ourselves and, 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 and seeing, look, where am I at with God? You know, and a, faithful, a faithful minister will do that. You know, he will not just just allow people to continue in their sin and say, well, you know, I know they're continuing in sin, but you know, we've got more people in the church. You know, we've got a bigger catch. To use the fishing analogy, we've got a bigger catch because I don't talk about sin. We've got a bigger catch because I don't ever talk about you know this particular touchy subject. So we want a big catch. That's not how it works. Um, Joseph Benson, who is uh, you might have seen Benson's Bible commentary, it's really, really well known. If you ever go read Bible commentaries or anything like that, Joseph Benson, really well known, uh, and he was a, a minister. And uh, he, he, he said this, he said that uh, congregations should be purged and purged regularly by, and then he names these three things, Christian discipline, strong, close exhortation, and well-regulated churches. That's, that's not common stacking them high, is it? That, that's saying, look, We've got the catch, we've got the fish. Now begins the really important process of cleansing, purging. How do we do that? Through Christian discipline? Through strong, close exhortation? That means getting to know one another. Get to talk about, you know, so so let's talk about the scriptures. Let's talk about what it means to follow Christ. Let's open up one another and decide, look, what does it mean to follow Jesus? What does it mean to be a Christian? Have you been born again? I mean, I, mean, I can walk into probably most churches in Manchester with a Bible under my arm, and, it, and you know, if no one knew me, the, the first question they would be asking would not be, are you born again? They would be saying, oh, what church did you used to go to? Or something like that. No one will be sitting me down saying, so Paul, you're a Christian, are you? What were you born again? What was that like? You know, how have you found your walk with the Lord? What, what, what temptations do you struggle with? You know, can I help you with any of those temptations? You know, let me share my thoughts with you about my life and about the sins I struggle with. You know, there has to be that honesty, that integrity, that is fellowship. 
Not walking into a church of, you know, 120 people and nodding at someone. That's not fellowship. You're just gathered in the same place. You know, being usually being entertained, or I mean, they might have something interesting to say, but you're not having fellowship. Fellowship is coming close to another brother or sister in Christ and, 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 and being of one mind. It's, it's, you know, it's preserving that, that uh, unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. These are the important things about Christian fellowship. Not packing out your church. Christian discipline. Strong, close, exhortation, well regulated churches. Do you, want, do you want my personal translation of that? Stop going easy on people. Stop excusing other people and your own sin. But start dealing with those things. This is the key to a healthy congregation. Stand on your principles. Stop complaining. You know, love truth even when other people call it hate. But hang on, if you did that, if you were that serious about it, wouldn't you lose half your catch? Wouldn't you lose probably even more than half your catch? Yes, well done. You have perceived the meaning of the parable of the net. Isn't that exactly what Jesus is saying? It's saying, look, you're going to throw back some of those fish. You're not going to take them all with you. They come in initially because of the gospel, but then there's a purging process. There's a process where you... you because why? Because Satan sows his seed as well. We did it in the parable of the weeds among the wheat. Do you remember? That, that like, hey, wow, look at this big congregation. Where have all these people come from? How all these people come from? Well, Satan sows his seed too. Wasn't that the warning that Jesus gives? Satan sows his seed too. And you know what? They look just like the real thing. They look just the same. So how do you tell? How can you find out whether they are real or not real? Through Christian discipline, strong, close exhortation, and well-regulated churches. It sounds a bit harsh, it sounds a bit cruel. But what does Paul say? Galatians 4, 16. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? I'm here to preach the truth. I can't compromise on that. I said to Carol this morning, I preach the same message. I got a thing came up on my, uh, what is it, Facebook. Is it Facebook? A Facebook thing that's from 2013, something that I, a quote that I you know, post and stuff. And I looked at it and thought, yeah, I still stand by that. I still believe that. I've not changed what I'm preaching, the message, since when we first started this church some eight and a half years ago. I still preach the same thing because I believe it's the truth. I'll preach it because I think, oh, everyone will like this. You know, I'll preach it because it's not up to me what I say. It's up to God. I'm taking his message and making it known. So, do I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Well, only if you're an enemy of the truth. Only if you hate truth and you're not looking for the truth. Then I will be your enemy. But for those who love truth, then I'm preaching the truth this morning. You know, it, it, again, Paul says earlier on in Galatians, For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. He's not going to, if, he was, if that was his whole uh, uh, agenda, to please men, he said, if that was, was that my agenda, if that's what I was seeking to do, to persuade men, to please men. I wouldn't be a servant of Jesus Christ, because you can't do that. Well, he is a servant of Jesus Christ, therefore, he's not trying to please men. He's not really interested in pleasing them, making them feel good about themselves. He's interested in the truth. 
And, and if you're a Christian this morning, that's what you should be interested in. The truth. You know, there's so many uh, uh, that I can't. Baby Christians. You know, you can't say anything out of step. You've got to, like, you've got to kind of apologize for everything you say before you say it. You can't carry on like that. You know, it's time to grow up. It's time, do you want the truth or don't you want it? You know, time, my time is limited here. I've got to share what Christ shares and expound it to you because that is the thing that will benefit you the most. The visible church, you see, is, met, is not made up of 100% Christians. The visible church is made up of people who are there, you know, for all different sorts of reasons. Uh, some come because they love the truth. Some come because they want to meet with brothers and sisters in Christ because they want to worship Jesus. That's why you should come. But some people come for different reasons. Temporal, uh, unspiritual reasons. I don't know. Free tea and coffee. Um, you know, food you can take home for free. You know, a bunch of ready-made friends who have to be nice to you. Uh, you know, people come to churches for all these different reasons. You know, they might come just because you know, they've got nothing to do on a Sunday morning. And, you know, okay, I'll go listen to some music and some guy wutter on for half an hour. It's worth it just to kind of get out of the cold. So people come for all uh, different reasons. And, uh, you know, this is nothing new. Uh, again, Jesus talks to those uh, who, who, who are following him. And he says, you know, you only came for the bread. You know that verse? John says, it, you came because I fed you. That's why you're coming. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a picture of a fleshly thing. Yeah? Oh, I was hungry. He fed me. I'll follow him. But they're not coming for spiritual reasons. They're not coming because they see that they're sinners who need salvation. There are many people who come to church uh, for very strange reasons. Um, <clears throat> anyone heard of Leonard Ravenhill? You heard of him? He's quite a... I think he's from Leeds originally. He's quite kind of abrupt sometimes. But he went, his ministry was over in America, you know. But he's, he, he has a way with words. And, uh, and, and he, he was still preaching and ministering to a ripe old age. And this is what he says. He says, I doubt that more than 2% of professing Christians in the United States are truly born again. Wow. <laughs> that I, that he said he said, I'm not here. Can you imagine that? Just let that sink in. He thinks, and he's, he's been a pastor for years, right? He's, he's lived it. He, he was out on the streets. I mean, they, when he was uh, in his 20s, he and uh, uh, a gang of other young lads, they got a wheelbarrow with a tent in it, and they went from one coast in England, you know, from the, I think from the east coast to the west coast, and back again, they would set up every night this tent and preach the gospel. And, and they slept on church floors or just on someone's couch. Where they didn't get paid for it, not a penny. They just committed themselves to Christ. You know, it's like in their early 20s when everybody else is like, yeah, they want a career, they want to do this, they want to get settled down. And he's like, no, we're going to commit ourselves to Christ. So he's living, you know, he's not just, he's just not just making inflammatory kind of statements. Uh, like you get on the internet, you know, he, he's lived it, he's, he's worked it, and then, and then it became, he's probably most well known actually, as, do you know the musician Keith Green, the, the pianist, the Christian musician, well, um, Leonard Ravenhill was his mentor, he kind of taught him, you know, uh, about Christ and, and, and helped him and so on. Now that doesn't mean he's always right, but it means he's, you know, he's got a reason to say this. You know, this is his experience of being in the United States. Now, how could it be? How could it be that, you know, you could be a professing, born-again Christian in the United States of America and, and he's saying less than 2%, he thinks, are genuine born-again Christians. I'm going to put it to you because those churches are not practicing Christian discipline, strong, close exhortation, and they're not being well regulated. In other words, they're not functioning as the body of Christ should function. I mean, I don't know what the, the, the number he would put, he's not with us anymore, but I don't know the number he would put on the UK at his time, I don't know. 
but um, but I know I know Wesley said something similar. Not one in a thousand is a genuine Christian. Not one, and he, and he goes through the, the numbers. And, and basically, what he's saying is, many many people who say I'm a Christian are not really Christians. They've never been born again. They've never have the Holy Spirit come and dwell within them. But they've been brought in by that, that net. They've been brought in by that gospel net, you know. They've come amongst all the other fish and they're there, they're in that congregation. But the problem is there's been no purging. You understand? There's been no there's been no preaching that's that's done that, that's begun that process. <coughs> In fact, many churches actually, the, the, the way they do things, and I've been around churches for, oh gosh, over 30 odd years, all different kinds of churches, and they all, many, many of them have this in common. The idea is, right, so our job is to remove every obstacle to a person's happiness and contentment. That's the way a, a lot of churches work. Am I right or am I wrong? And they'll say, right, this person doesn't like this. No, no worries, we'll just get rid of that. We'll change that. Oh, this person's unhappy. You know, it's a bit cold. We'll turn the heat up. Oh, this person, they don't really like him. So we'll put some new songs in. You know, it's like everything you do is to try and make the people happy. Why? Because you don't want to lose them. They come in in that initial net, that, that gospel kind of, kind of drawing in. You've drawn them in. Now our, now our mission is not to lose them. And therefore, what do they like? Give them what they like. Give them what they like. Just 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 set, just get rid of everything that individual finds difficult, doesn't like. I have to tell you this morning that the Lord Jesus Christ, to my knowledge, never, ever, ever did anything like that in the New Testament. He never so what would you like? Do you like this? Okay. He never sought to remove obstacles or make it easy for people to follow him. In fact, I'm going to stick my neck out here and say he did the exact opposite to that. He produced many, many reasons for not following him. Count the cost. So let's say, just follow me and everything will be okay. Count the cost of following me. Deny yourself. Take up your cross daily. Don't look back. If you look back, you're not worthy <coughs> of the kingdom. If any man come unto me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Are you a disciple of Christ this morning? Then all that has to apply to you. Yeah, all that. Has, did you count the cost? Are you denying yourself? Are you taking up your cross? Do you hate these things? Do you hate even your own life? To the extent that you will give that up to follow Jesus Christ. Sounds like a dangerous thing to do. I wonder what the what are the results of that? John 6 tells us. John chapter 6, verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Oh, so what why, why, why has Jesus done that? It's the parable of the net. He hauls them in, he brings them in with the gospel, and then he says, okay, you want to follow me? This is what it's going to be like. And what happens is, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. It's too tough, it's too hard. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, so this is his, his little faithful core of followers, will ye also go away? How about you guys? Is it too hard for you? Do you want to go? Do you want to go? Do you want to follow the crowd and go and leave them? Have I made it too difficult for you too? See, it's the spirit of this. Christ is, is purging this catch 
of followers. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Correct answer, Peter. Correct answer. Peter said, look, it's going to be hard. He doesn't know how hard, does he? It's going to be hard to follow you, Jesus. But where else am I going to go? You've got the words of eternal life. I found the truth with you. So what? Yes, it's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. But where do I go to? I've got to follow Christ. We've got to follow Him. But for most people, for most people, it's too hard. It's a step. To, it's too radical. It's too difficult. It means giving up things that they like, that they're comforted by. They're not comforted by the Holy Spirit. They're comforted by worldly things, by possessions, by popularity, and so on. Verse 26 of John, I said it to you before. Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me, not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labour not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. So that is, Jesus said, look, I'm doing this for your, your benefit, for the benefit of your soul. I'm showing you these things that you used to love and you used to build your life around, they're of no eternal value. Learn to get your pleasure and your joy from the things of God. Yeah? Learn to find fulfillment in, in me, Christ is saying. You know, He must have the preeminence of first place in our lives. And we must teach our children that Christ has the preeminence, that He is more important than anything else that you have in your life. Stop getting distracted and hung up over temporal, worldly things that will pass away. You know, the Bible says, we are not promised tomorrow. Come tomorrow, all those things could disappear. And you're stood before a holy God. You know, you're stood before Him in judgment uh, to give an account of your life before Him. Think about that. And we'll stand before that holy God. Where will the people that walked away from Christ be? Where will the people that were caught up initially in that net, but in the end said, this is too hard, this is too difficult? Well, this parable tells us where they'll be. Cast into the furnace of fire, where there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. I don't need to go into that, you know what that means. Right? So therefore, we need, if we want to follow Christ, we need to be willing to yield to His Spirit, willing to yield to that examination, both self-examination, but also examination by brothers and sisters in Christ. That's part of fellowship, you know, is, is that we build trust with one another, that we can come and talk about, about the Scriptures and talk about how we overcome sin and talk about well, well, what you do when you're tempted, you have... How did you escape? How did you get over it? How did you overcome that temptation? Oh, well, I found this really useful. That, that, that's a church functioning healthy. Yeah? If nobody's allowed close to you, if all the barriers go up and no one's allowed to, to, to look into your life and, and hear about your spiritual walk with God, why? Why? So, I want to kind of, as it were, put you under the spotlight in one sense. Um, I don't want answers to these things, but I I'm going to give you some questions that you can answer yourself. Okay, before your own conscience and before God. Why do you come here? Why do you come to stop walking in Evangelical Church? Why do you come to this baby? It could be that uh, it could be that 
it's near to your house. Yeah? The building's near to your house, therefore you come and, uh, and, and it's, not, it's not too far to walk, so therefore I'll come here. It could be um, you come here because there are people you know here. And, uh, you know, I want to go somewhere where I know somebody. Could be because, you know, you like uh, King James Version of the Bible. It could be because uh, you like the kind of hymns. The reason you should come here really is because God wants you to come here. Yeah. Be obedient to Christ. Go, so I always say to people, go, I've had people come here and say, do you think God wants me to come here? I say, well that's you too, Adam. <laughs> so that's not me. Do you think this is the right place for me? I don't know. You ask God. You should go where God sends you. And unless God says, stop going there, you should carry on going where God sends you. What do you want? What do you want from a church? What do you want from Christ himself? Do you want eternal life? And if so, are you prepared to, to count that cost, to pay the cost? What do you really want? I know everyone says, oh, you know, I want to serve Christ. Not to. It's a time of self-examination. It's, you know, Paul says, examine yourself, see where you be in the faith. It's good to ask ourselves these questions. What do I really want? Because if all I really want is Christ, and all I really want is the truth, and all I really want is a group of people that love me and that I can love, that's not a lot to ask, is it? That, that's, well, I say that. <laughs> In material terms, if you found that, why would you be dissatisfied? We looked at, uh, in the house group, we looked at contentment with godliness is great gain. You know? If you can learn to be content with those things, I've got Christ, I've got the truth, I've got brothers and sisters in Christ who love me. Whoa, I'm rich, I've got a lot, you know? So learn that contentment. And here's, a, here's an interesting question. What would stop you coming? What would stop you coming and meeting together with the world of here? If I got a drum kit, come on in. Like, I'm off on his, that's, I'm out of here, I'm out of that. If we stop serving tea and coffee, oh, I need a little tea and coffee. I'm going to fucking somewhere else where they do serve tea and coffee. I mean, I'm not joking, some people can't be that thick or that shallow. Or maybe God said, okay, I want to go here instead. That would be a good reason, wouldn't it? Because you're following God's direction. You know what I'm saying? We do things sometimes and we think that we're doing them. We think we're doing them because God is leading us. But actually, we're just showing our own personal preferences. You know, I want to go somewhere that's not too far away. I want to go somewhere that's got a nice big car park. I want to go somewhere where it's warm. I want to go somewhere. There are people genuinely, although they may not realise it, this is their criteria. You know, it's like, what, are you choosing a school for your kid or something? You know, what are the amenities? How long does the meeting last? You know, really? Seriously? What about the truth? What about I'm looking for other people who love the truth of God's word? I'm looking for a group of people that doesn't have to be hundreds who desire to share the gospel with the lost. You know, that's all I'm looking for. And when I find that, I'll be content. Is that still, is that still, you know, what would stop the coming? But why? Why? So the parable of the dragnet is about the gathering together of people with the gospel, through the gospel. And it's about a purging that will start a judgment in the church. When you come into those people, it should start. It should start with when you know you, you become convicted of, you know, okay, I need to give up smoking. You know, it's not right now. Uh, it was okay before, but now I feel bad about that. Okay, I need to stop doing this. Uh, okay, I need to start doing this. Uh, Maybe you, 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 you become a Christian and you've lived all your life just you, know, you and your family, you're not really interacting with anybody else. Now it's all these strangers 
who claim to be your brother or sister or like a family now. So now it's time to kind of move out of that, kind of change your mindset, and change the way you think about that because this is what Christ expects now, is that you love one another, that you, you take care of one another. And it might mean altering everything in your life, you know. I know Christians who have their hearts set, they're going to go to university, they're going to do this, they had it all mapped out. They became a Christian, it's like, you know, I don't think I want to do that. I don't think God wants me to do that anymore. I think He wants me to do this instead. You have to be open to that. It's about surrendering your whole life to the Holy Spirit and understanding you can trust God. Yeah? You can trust Him with your life, with everything. Otherwise, you're not living by faith, are you? Yeah, if you trust your bank account, or you trust your job, uh, you're not trusting Christ. You're not living by faith. When Jesus preached hard, people turned away. They did. It's like too hard for us. You can't follow us. When any preacher, any minister of the gospel preaches hard, he should be doing it out of love for the people that are there, out of <coughs> passion for their souls. <coughs> because if he's not doing that, he considers you not his congregation but his audience. You know, he's just there entertaining, uh, we're talking about this morning, you know, kind of regaling you with stories of this on holiday. You know, that's an after dinner speaking, that's not preaching. Preachers have got a serious job to do, and that is to expand the word of God and to lead people into following Christ <coughs> and walking in true holiness. And that's what I'm trying to do. If it comes over sometimes it's a bit hard or a bit harsh, I'm sorry. You know, it's not meant like that. It's meant to, to deliver to you the truth of what Christ has said and what the apostles have said. So that your soul might be strong in Christ. So when the storms come, you're able to stand. You know, you're not going to get overwhelmed by them. Your roots should be deep in Christ, deep in Him. Right, let's stop there. Let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the Word of God. Thank you, Lord, that we can stand upon it, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that we can trust it. And that whatever else is going on in our lives, Lord, I thank you that you love us, Lord, and this is why you take us that hard, narrow path. If we would but trust you, Lord, if we would but trust you more, how much more would we experience of those riches that are beyond compare?